Good morning, and thank you all for being here for our 10th anniversary celebration and, uh, and the 2019 Sage Assembly. So uh, let's start immediately. Who's been to an assembly before? Looks like about half. Who's been to more than five? Oh, actually, maybe only about 10% of the room. That's, that's pretty amazing. OK. Um, so the, let me tell you a little bit about the assembly so you know what to expect. Um, so SAGE works as conveners of um, research communities, participant communities, many communities across many different sectors of um, biomedical research. And what we found is the, the time where we see um, the most inspiration and the most innovation is when diverse groups of people come together to bring many perspectives to a problem. And so the assembly, in many ways, the embodiment of that. What you have around you is a diverse set of individuals with many different expertise. Um, and so the goal of today is for you to listen to, contribute to, and learn from all of those around you. Um, so because of that, we've traditionally picked topics for the assembly that are adjacent to all of our expertise. And the goal here really is uh, pretty simple. It's to make sure that there's a level playing field on which everybody can interact um, and, and equally contribute. Um, this year, we have uh, taken the liberty on the event of our anniversary of picking a topic that is a little bit closer to home. So um, forgive us that indulgence, and, and I hope that it won't disappoint. Um, so I stand here in front of you representing uh, not just myself um, or our organizing committee, but a whole wide group of people um, at SAGE as represented here. Um, and what we've actually found over the years and increasingly, and in particular this year, is that while the assembly was a place where we all learned to convene, in fact, this group of individuals is doing their own convening. Every single one of them could be standing up here, managing, organizing, and, and leading this. And so um, I really stand up here as their representative, and you will see that throughout the day, um, where you will see actually very little of me or um, John and Brian and Diane, the other organizers. Um, you will see these people standing up here, and that is um, absolutely by design. Um, there are some other people in the audience that I'd like to recognize as well. So today we have not just the SAGE um, employees in the audience, but we actually also have the board of directors. Um, could I ask the members of the board to stand up so people can see who you are? So I recommend talking to these people in the lunch buffet. You may get a very different perspective. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so in addition to that, this year for the first time ever, SAGE has convened a scientific advisory board, and uh, several of the members of our scientific advisory board are also in the audience. Could you guys stand up? One, two, three, and I think uh, four. Great. So these are also great people to talk to in the lunch buffet line. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm going to just take a second to set the stage um, so that you get a sense of of why we framed this assembly um, around this topic. Um, so here's a, a overly simplistic graph of what the scientific method looks like. This is actually how I was taught to do science um, back in graduate school. And it worked really well when I was doing biology in a Petri dish. Um, there was this, uh, th this loop that I, as a scientist, continue to go around in which I was uh, thinking of questions, figuring out how to answer the question, satisfying myself with my answer to the question and repeating. Um, and this works, I think, reasonably well in many cases, but as we've moved to a, a digital world, um, this infrastructure, this, this, this world which was built um, <laughs> in the pre-digital world, um, sometimes falls apart. Um, and this is for a whole host of reasons, I think. Um, part of it is about this conclusion piece. Um, it's, it's never a good idea for the person 
uh, running, building a hypothesis and running an experiment to have the sole um, control over determining whether their conclusions are valid or not. And of course, this isn't fully how science works. We talk to each other all the time at meetings like this, at conferences, through papers. Um, but the increasing volume of, of scientists and information that's coming out, I think, I think the, the latest stat I saw was that there's 800,000 papers published a year, make it very difficult for the scientific community to effectively peer review the conclusions of each group. And so we run into a problem of understanding how we can take individual experiments and information and turn it into collective knowledge. Um, now, there are many reasons why our scientific infrastructure doesn't su support this as effectively as it once did. Um, I, I think a lot of them are, are pretty well known. It has to do with um, incentives and, and publishing structures and, and tenure structures and, you know, VC structures, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Which, which is all to say we're all doing our best here. We all have our best, we have in mind the best intentions, but we're sometimes not able to look at the long game because we're, um, we're having to look in the short term um, at, 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 mis at other incentives, right? And so I, I've been showing this slide for about a year and I've promised myself that this is the last time I will show it because usually when I show it, the scientists in the audience um, stop listening to what I have to say. <laughs> um, we may all want to be working together as if we are a polo team driving towards knowledge, but actually in many cases we are not able to achieve that because we have our own incentives and needs um, to continue, uh, um, that we need to fill in order to be able to continue the work that we do, right? So we end up looking a little bit more like this. Um, I also think that there's uh, a problem that we need to acknowledge and actually partly a problem but also a beauty in that we, we are all human beings and so we come to science thinking that we can be completely objective when in fact as humans we are not, right? And so this is a wonderful book um, that I've been reading called The Sea People by Christina Thompson um, and it's a book about the history of the Polynesian migration, right? So the, the Polynesian people populated the Pacific Ocean, all of the islands on the Pacific Ocean, an area that, as you can see, is broadly the size of half of the globe, um, from New Zealand to Easter Island and all the way up to Hawaii by canoe, right? So that's amazing. Um, and what Christina found as she started to write this history was, in fact, uh, there wasn't any evidence to write this history from the perspective of the Polynesian people. They have an oral history, um, which is much more about the, the who and the why and a lot less about the when or the how. And so what it ended up being was a history of how the European people tried to piece together what the Polynesians had done, right? It became a, a history on science. And for hundreds of years, the European people simply could not believe the data that the Polynesians had populated this vast expanse of ocean by canoe, and so they collectively agreed on other theories, right? One was that um, humans independently evolved on each of these islands at the same time. Um, and one was that the ocean had somehow drained so people could walk <laughs> across, right? And so these are ridiculous, and uh, Christina at least assures me that they were equally as ridiculous at the time. It's not through the, you know, the backward lens of time that we think they're ridiculous, but still, they seemed more sensible to the scientists of the time than did the actual, shall we say, truth in as much as we know it now. So this happens in science. This happens as medicine all the time as well. So um, there was often a collective consensus that leeches were the right way to treat many ailments. Um, in fact, for many years we thought that illness was caused by bad humors. Um, and actually it wasn't until the technology of the microscope came along that we were able to see um, empirical evidence to prove otherwise, right? So we tell stories and we interpret data 
sometimes in nonsensical um, but consensus building way towards um, stories that we believe to be true. And oftentimes it's when technology comes along that provides more sensitive data that we're able to um, take a closer look and rule out some of those things. Um, I think part of the danger in this is that uh, scientists are broadly educated and trained in the same way. We go through the same processes, we're taught to think about problems in the same logical step, we're taught how to write papers, we're taught how to write grants, um, we're taught how to do those things in the way that leads to the highest likelihood of getting published um, in impressive journals and to be able to actually get our grants funded. And so we end up with a little bit of a monoculture in thought, which is not to say that there aren't many scientists with wonderful innovative ideas, but we're all sort of taught how to, how to parse those ideas and pick them apart um, in the same way. And that allows us to communicate and many of those ways are very logical, but um, it can also lead to a bit of a monoculture. And as we know from agriculture, that, that's a little dangerous. Um, so what happens when these sorts of monocultures rise up in resource limited settings, which much of science is, um, we, we get the sorts of stories that, that you hear about here, right? So there's a lot of press right now about um, the monoculture that is uh, drug therapy development in Alzheimer's disease. So there's a pervading, prevailing hypothesis in Alzheimer's disease <coughs> excuse me, um, the amyloid hypothesis. And in a resource limited setting of the last couple of decades, every um, major academic clinical group and every major pharmaceutical company has gone off after this same hypothesis as the way to try to build a therapy to um, a disease that currently has none. Um, and they've all failed. And because of the lack of diversity in the hypotheses that they're going after, the whole field is now collectively at the same place that they were, right? So in a, in a world of unlimited resources, of course we would have looked at lots of things, but a world of limited resources, how might we think about um, hedging our bets a little bit more than is shown in this example? And so to some degree, I think open science is uh, a movement that arose out of these observations, right? This is this is a way, actually this is many ways, it's a suite of methods that is used to try to get around some of the limitations that our current scientific infrastructure um, has shown. And we had a, a small convening of, of some experts in the field um, this winter, and we found that uh, many people were doing many different things under the guise of open science, and they were doing them for two major purposes. Um, on the one hand, um, individuals were saying practically, in the research I want to do, I have run into the following barrier, and I'm looking for a way around it, and I see that open systems can help me do that. And on the other side, we had a whole group of people who were saying, the entire scientific infrastructure needs to be changed and built up from the bottom, and open approaches can help us to get around some of those problems, but we need to do it from the ground up. And so those are two very different um, strategies that you would take, and, and we see them we see them all um, we see them all in occurrence. Um, so what I think about is interesting about open science, and particularly here as we sit here at our our tenth anniversary, right? Is that this is not a new concept. This is now a concept that has been around long enough, and that been, people have been working through enough um, that we can start to see how it's working and and maybe how it isn't. And, um, and to me, I think that that's both wonderful and, and exciting, and we can start to learn from our own empirical evidence to guide us along the way, um, but it also means that we start to run into some of those challenges um, that I described earlier, right, because we are ourselves scientists running an experiment on open science. And so the goal of today is to take a closer look at that to be able to acknowledge that all of the work that's happening in open science is not leading necessarily to the um, intended consequences that we had, um, and that there are externalities that we should be considering. And so what I hope we've put in place for you 
is an agenda that allows us to take a topic that's um, near and dear to many of our hearts and look at it from a new angle. So um, I wanted to end with just a couple more thoughts along this way. Um, so how many people have heard of or read this book? Oh, actually less than I thought. So this is a fascinating, provocative book. Um, I'm not gonna make any statements here about whether it's true or false, but the concept here is that as we move into a world where billionaire philanthropists are making, um, uh, are, are making bets that they hope will change the world, um, we, we, we may run into a danger because the incentives of the people who are on the top are not necessarily to change the system, and so they are necessarily going to be looking at um, only a suite, those suite of solutions that don't change the system in a way that's deleterious to them. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't really have an opinion one way or the other about the philanthropic billionaires and their incentives, but I can say that this is another angle, another look at what I was talking about earlier, right? We are all incentivized to, to keep going um, and to succeed in the thing that we hold most dear, right? I, I run an 80-person organization, and, um, right, and at the moment, I'm, I'm the major breadwinner for my family, and so both of those things do take, I do take those into account when I make decisions. Um, and so while I wanna look at the long game, there are always incentives. Um, there are always other incentives we need to think about. Um, so at SAGE, when we think about open science, we think that what it needs to do is roughly the following three things. It, it, it needs to allow scientists to be evaluating their experiments, their hypotheses, with reliable data. They need to know the data is reliable. We all need to know that. Um, it needs to allow objective evaluation of conclusions, um, and it needs to bring in the independent and diverse viewpoints of many individuals. And I, um, I wanna end with two more thoughts. One is about uh, this program, Teach for America. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with Teach for America. This is a, this is a program that takes um, college graduates and places them for two or three years as teachers in underserved schools that are in need of teachers. Um, and I heard an interview with the founder of Teach for America recently, and what I found amazing about it was um, her intention was only partly to provide teachers in underserved schools. Um, her other equal intention was actually to teach the leaders of tomorrow um, to see a broader perspective of the world than they had grown up with themselves. She was actually, actually conceived of this idea as an undergraduate, um, I think she was an undergraduate, at Princeton where she was looking at around at people who had all grown up with roughly the same life she had had and were all having the same experiences and were gonna be the leaders of tomorrow. Um, and so I took this to heart because I actually, I had a roommate, um, I think in the year 2000, who was in Teach for America. So she finished an engineering degree at Stanford and then moved into teaching high school math in East Palo Alto for two or three years. And she gave everything she could to those students for those two or three years and I didn't think much more of it. But um, she's had many careers since then and actually one of them was working for News Corps, um, building out and running their data science center which uses that information to decide who sees what news. Right? And so those sorts of questions are adjacent to what a program like Teach for America was trying to do, but, um, but for sure she's making decisions that bring those experiences into her life and, and that can, that the broaden viewpoint can only be a good thing. And so we need to think about this um, kind of capacity building across everybody involved in science including our leaders as we move forward. Okay, final point, one of hope, right? So this is a graph um, of uh, evaluating 10 years of articles in the medical uh, literature that were evaluating um, existing um, medical practices you know, that were being used in the clinic and demonstrated that a, pra 
approximately 40% of the ones that were being evaluated were refuted as, as not better than other standards of care. So, so maybe that's terrifying to you. Maybe that's saying, I, I can't believe we're um, allowing um, ourselves as individuals to be um, seen in a medical system where, where so much of the medicine we're using is actually, uh, as it turns out, not well supported. But I also think it's a, it's a message of hope, right? Um, we're all learning, whether it's as scientists or, or clinicians or individuals going through our life, we're all constantly experimenting and giving ourselves the ability, the, the space to continue to evaluate things even after we've exposed them as truths or, or knowledge to the rest of the world is actually a really brave thing to be doing. And it's something that we all um, should keep in mind um, within our own lives. Um, <laughs> so maybe this is a stretch, but um, I think if, if we think about wanting not a monoculture in science, but a polyculture, we may think about what that would look like, right? And so, so here's a picture of a farm um, practicing polyculture. And in fact, it, it may look quite a lot like the past, um, but I think it might look quite a lot like the future as well. Okay, so with that, we're gonna get into it. So what you're gonna see is a series, throughout the day is a series of talks um, and panels that allows us to explore open science, how it's working, how it's not working, um, and, and maybe some of the other um, expectations and assumptions um, that you haven't thought of yet. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna introduce, oh no I'm not, um, this is probably the most important slide. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is probably the most important slide. Um, so this is a room that should be considered safe and welcoming to all opinions and all people. And so we expect each of you and ourselves to operate under that paradigm. Um, and if you have any concerns yourself, um, please come contact one of the organizers, go to the registration desk. Um, we will support you in um, whatever uh, you may need.